Hello, and welcome to AFAC's CMO Dialogues. I'm your host, Susmita, and today we have with us Rohit Basin, Head Propositions Consumer Bank and Chief Marketing Officer, Kotak Mahindra Bank. Welcome, Rohit. Thank you so much for having me here, Susmita. Rohit has been with uh, Hindustan Unilever for almost 25 years, where he spearheaded marketing for a variety of brands, uh, including Ponds, Glow and Lovely, Life Boy, Surf, Rin. So Rohit, um, about two years ago, uh, you ended your uh, association with uh, Unilever and moved to a bank. Kotak, so uh, can you tell us a little about the similarities and dissimilarities um, between uh, the FMCG sector and especially the personal care sector and uh, banking? So look, at the end of the day, uh, you know, in my view, a bank itself is also a consumer products company. You're selling uh, products to consumers. The difference being that uh, uh, in the case of an FMCG I mean, you're, you're offering the consumers are hiring you for a particular job that they want to be want to do or, or a job that they want to get done. Uh, and if you do the job very well, they will hire you again. If you don't do that job very well, they will fire you. Now, whether uh, you know she's searching for a product to make her look beautiful or to make her clothes clean, uh, you know, or she's looking for a, a place to park her salary into or take a loan for buying a house or make a payment to her friend. At the end of the day, there is a job that she's trying to do and each of these products and brands actually help her do those jobs. And the, the products which help her do the job better will stay with her and the ones that don't do the job well, she will move on from them to the other jobs. So that really is a similarity in the way I kind of see whether it is uh, an HUL selling uh, a skin cream or a detergent bar or a Kotak Mahindra bank uh, you know, selling a credit card or a savings account, or a business banking uh, account to the consumer. What is different? Mm -hmm. uh, what I realized was the fact that when you work in a company like HUL, which always just relies on understanding the needs and aspirations of consumers, that kind of becomes the way of life. And all your products and propositions that you build are all built around keeping the consumer at the heart of everything we do. Uh, when you come to a bank, and it's not just Kotak, but, but the category as a whole, has been more of a what I call the supply side kind of a category or the push driven category, where you don't start much with what the consumer wants, but what is the product that you have and then go find a consumer who can buy it. And, and trying to bring that culture shift of starting from the consumer at the heart of everything that you do, understanding what his or her needs are, and then building the right products and propositions to meet those needs has really been the, uh, the shift in, in the culture and also the way that we work that I've been trying to bring here in the last year and a half that I've been here. Got it. Um, I have a question. So um, one thing, while the consumer is at the center of it, one thing that is different perhaps is also um, the frequency of the decision one needs to make to purchase uh, or buy into a brand, right? So I can poss I'm possibly buying a soap every two months, but that's not the same with my relationship with a bank. How does that influence decision making? So yes, you're right. Uh, any service related category is 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 a category which is much which has very high uh, higher exit barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you you're right. You bought a soap. You didn't like it. You didn't like the fragrance. You didn't like the lather. You can next time you're going to buy a soap, you can you'll buy another soap. You have you buy a soap every month, so you have twelve purchase occasions in a year. So uh, you know versus buying into a bank is a very very thought through uh, decision because you don't change your bank accounts very very easily, and especially if you've got vested into a bank account for the last ten years and you've got your salary coming to the bank, you got your investments going through us. A standard instruct you know a sip you've let's say have got credit cards from three places and you you're doing those payments again through a standing instructions on your bank you got a loan uh, and again there's a standing instruction now imagine porting all of this into another bank is is not easy or you've given your bank account to five insurance you know five five insurance companies or three mutual funds and when you redeem the 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 the, the fund uh, the fund straight away come into that bank account so you've got once you get into a bank account, you you hopefully for the bank, you want to kind of link itself into a lot of products, and therefore uh, the portability is not as easy 
as it is from moving from one soap to the other. And that's why uh, when you look at choosing a bank, the, the number one decision-making criteria is actually trust. When you're going to put your hard-earned money uh, into a bank, you think from your heart. But when you take a loan from a bank, you think from your mind. You don't mind, uh, you know, that someone told me when I joined the bank that it's a game between the heart and the mind. And getting someone to start a relationship with you is, is really built on three things. One is about getting their trust. Second is offering banking as a very, uh, you know, convenience is a very, very important attribute when you decide. Uh, if you want to make a payment at 12 o'clock in the night and if your app doesn't work, you've lost the trust of the bank. Uh, you lost the trust of the consumer. Uh, and therefore, the role of, of technology to deliver convenience is extremely important. So those are the three things in terms of uh, uh, trust, convenience, followed by technology when you're choosing a bank to put your hard-earned money in. When you decide to take a loan from a bank, uh, the more important things are, start to come are things like uh, the interest rate that you're getting the loan at, mm -hmm. the offers that the bank has. And of course, convenience is equally important. Uh, but somewhere the trust goes down as a criteria because here you're taking someone else's money and not putting your money into the bank. Uh, and I think this is the, the biggest difference between a fast-moving consumer goods and a, and a banking as a service is that uh, because it's not very easy for, for, for you to switch banks, it's also very difficult for you to make someone from switch from their existing bank to your bank. Uh, so that's, it's tougher, but once you do get a customer coming to you, the exit barriers are much higher than what would be there when it comes to choosing a bar of soap or a, bar, or, or, or a bottle of shampoo. How do you use AI uh, to inform your uh, marketing strategy um, these days? I mean, has that already become uh, an integral part of uh, how you uh, perform your daily uh, uh, work? So look, the, uh, the most basic use of AI is in terms of removing repetitive tasks automating them and, and uh, reducing costs. Now, that's really the, the most uh, basic use of AI. Uh, but for me, the real use of AI is when you can actually analyze realms and realms of data and predict consumer behavior. And based on your prediction of how the consumer would behave, mm -hmm. create the right product propositions for the consumers and, and therefore lead to higher business growth. That for me is the most fundamental use of AI as to how it can move, you know, to a more predictive uh, way of working rather than just automating uh, repetitive tasks. And in that case, what the way we've really built our AI capabilities is is we've, we're really working on building a very strong data stack uh, and and build the whole data in the organization into what I call the 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 calculators and the the consumers of data. So the compute and the consume. Uh, part of the organization. So the the compute part of the organization is is data scientists to look at uh, data and and look at the trends coming out from the data uh, and and be able to really build the right algorithms which can uh, give a credit person the decision making ability that should I give uh, credit to this person who's applied for a credit card uh, or uh, if how do I get to know if someone is about to uh, go go de delinquent and therefore what decision do I want to take on that? And then you have what I call as the, uh, the, the data consumers, which are the brand teams uh, and their data analyst teams, which ask data these questions and based on the answers they get, they then build the right propositions for those. So let me, let me work this out with a live example. So, you know, let's just say, uh, you know, there's a person, uh, Ramesh, who's, who's, who's been just about to finish his, his post-graduation and is uh, starting his first job. Until now, he's really been living in a college co campus and, and uh, you know living on the stipend which his parents have uh, given to him up while they're paying their fees. And he's starting to earn for the first time. So he wants to spend. He really wants to spend because you know saving is not the correct key motivation for him right now. He wants to spend. He wants to invest a bit, but, but spend is his biggest driver. And, and while he may earn 40,000 rupees, but he wants to feel that his salary is 60,000 rupees. And therefore, uh, anyone who gives him a great cash back, great rewards, uh, makes him makes his strat salary stretch more is the right uh, partner for him at this stage. So if I want to give him a credit card and he may not even have a credit history, how do I use all, all the data which is available with me about him 
to be able to predict what is is he a good customer to give a credit card to what is the kind of limit that i what should give to him so that you know it, he uses that limit and but he's able to pay that back and once i've kind of decided that he's a good card customer this is the limit i want to give to him then uh, the the product person picks it up from there and and says okay uh, what is the right proposition to take to him is he a guy who's uh, governed more by a great cash back or is he a guy governed more by let's say uh, loyalty points and therefore should the proposition be around cash back or should the proposition be around loyalty points so once you build the right proposition then the 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 marketer picks it up from there and and, and looks at the data and says okay what is the right emotional pitch that i can make to him in advertising from there the media person looks at data and 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 then says okay how do i maximize the return on investment uh, on the campaign that i do with him uh, and now he's using the card he's starting to use the card the product guy comes back and looks at his his card spends and decides you know what should be the right pricing to give to him what is the where should he give to him the ability to rotate through an emi where should he give him a, something else so that i can maximize make him maximize the limit that he has while still make sure that he doesn't go delinquent and i am able to return uh, recover the money from him uh, but but in a credit card business it is not just about spending it's also about recovering the money and therefore looking at data trends how does the collections guy know that who is likely to go delinquent but who is likely to pay back and the person who is about to default you don't want to get to know that data that insight after he's defaulted D- difficult to recover money later on if you know that this guy is likely to default in the next 3 months how would the collections guy speak to him what is the messaging to the collections guy would give to him so there is a greater chance that he's able to get the money back so if you look at this is ai for me it at it is at every element of the every touch point of the entire business value is not just about marketing it's about every touch point how you can use data in a manner that you can predict consumer behavior and then build the right proposition for him whether it's collection whether it's credit whether it's marketing and a good ai user is one who understands this at every touch point in every part of the business and really and really builds the right proposition for the consumer at every touch point thank you that was a very detailed uh, you know example i now follow it and uh, i have another question again on you know technology is the digital led con- consumer experience is also very important because often we don't go to a bank anymore to uh, do a lot of transactions so i want to understand um, like you gave me examples with the ai thing you know how do you approach the digital um, interactions that a consumer has with kotak how do you make them seamless uh, any examples that you can give on how you're making the digital experience the cx very uh, seamless for consumers yeah so that's a very very interesting question because at one end you're seeing all the banks dramatically increasing the the physical footprint opening new branches at the same time we know that customers are reducing their frequency of coming to branches so 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 what is right and how do you make sure you deliver on both so i think the the let me give you a live example so how do i choose i'm suppose i work with kotex so so i my salary account is at kotex so i'm not allowed to open a bank account with anyone else uh, but if you're a consumer who has the choice of opening bank accounts anywhere uh, i i don't i do 90% of my my or 95% or even 100% of all my transactions digitally uh but, but but when i'm choosing the bank account that i want to choose and i see three branches of three bank accounts right under my house i'm most likely going to choose one of those three as long as their digital experience on their app is good because i know that they might be once a year i have to go to a branch some something gets stuck on the on the app i can't do it and i want to make sure that the branch is nearby so that you know i can just go and and i know that i'll be treated well there so that's the way i kind of choose uh, while i while i do all my transactions digitally but there's also the importance of having a physical branch uh, close by for you to to kind of uh, have that trust that if i need it on a on a urgent basis there's someone who's going to help me there but when it comes to digital it's about the way we look at this is the fact that how can i eliminate the need for the customer to come to the branch every digital every transaction should be able we should be able to do it digitally you know uh, whether it's and you use a bank effectively for five things you know you you open an account because that's really the place where all your money comes in and goes out from you want to make payments uh you do investments you want to protect yourself your house your family so you do insurance uh 
and then you want to buy something for which you don't have money, so you take a loan. So these are the five five pillars: bank account, investments, insurance, payments, and lending. Now the simple belief that we have is that I want to automate each and every of these use cases so that the person should be able to just use my mobile banking app for everything and anything that they do. We are always in this journey of understanding how does the consumer journey happen? What are the areas where the drop-offs are happening? What are the, and how do you remove those pains and uh, pain points in that journey? So that the journey is fast, the journey is easy, journey is intuitive, and it ends up with the consumer being a happy consumer who's able to do his banking transaction online and doesn't need to come to the bank. I would think that automating a lot of the processes is, is actually one of those things that removes friction, makes things easy for a consumer. But do you also think there is such a thing as over-reliance on these digital tools at any point, um, especially now with, you know, integrating AI into a lot of customer service? Many times, you know, you have to call a bank to say, okay, you know, I want to possibly block a credit card or I'm trying to regenerate a PIN or uh, things like that. And then you are faced with um, an AI uh, interface and are human beings um, more inclined to communicate with other human beings or AI? Are these things that you also ponder about um, when you think of um, customer service and these telephone interactions that, that consumers have? So look, uh, I, I personally believe that the customer wants to get his or her job done. I don't, I don't believe that a human can do a job better than AI or AI can do a job better than human. It's about understanding the steps that need to go in, in helping the consumer do his or her job. And, uh, you know, and it only doesn't matter if the person doing the job is, is, a, is a bot or is a, is a human as long as the job is done. So, for example, you know, I want a state, I'm, I'm filing my tax returns and I want an interest statement. Now, I just want an interest statement. Doesn't really matter if, if, if the person whom I'm calling up at the branch or calling up at the bank's uh, line is a bot or is is it a is it a human? As long as uh, you know, I give in my details of of what I want and my job gets done with minimal, uh, you know, this basic level of verification is done to make sure that it's not a fraudulent ask which I'm trying to do and the job kind of gets done. I think at the, as a bank, we have to figure out how do we make our processes so seamless for consumers mm -hmm. that it should not matter to them whether a, a human did it or a bot did it. And I think that is where we are working on and we're, we're trying to reach a place mm -hmm. where it could, I mean, I, I've, I'll give an example of good and bad experiences. And I'll give you first of a bad experience. You know, I was trying to invest uh, and, and I transferred my money to the to the broker and the money had not kind of reached there and then I went to the site and I wanted to chat with someone because somehow the phone number was not working mm -hmm. and I had to kind of wait for five minutes for the chat to get started mm -hmm. and even after the chat and, and imagine uh, two times the chat started I mean I waited for five minutes chat didn't start I went on to do something else and I came back and said you you've been disconnected start the chat again the second time also the same thing happened so and I just realized that hey uh, if if you want me to wait, I'm not just going to sit in front of my screen waiting for you. I might be doing something else. How do I build a mechanism where the moment I'm ready to have a chat with you, I should have told you, hey, I'm busy. As uh, The waiting time is three to four minutes. But the moment I'm ready, I will ping you so that you can come back to the chat window. Something as basic as that would have just uh, you know made the user experience much better. Uh, another one, I was trying to, from a mutual fund uh, house, I was trying to get a a TDS statement and, and I just went in, it was 12 o'clock in the night, the call center was not there and I and I, I was actually abroad that time so I could not even call because I've been an international call. But I just uh, uh, went to the chatbot and I put in my folio number, uh, they asked me some details, I gave the details and my statement was, was there for me to download. So it's about just understanding the user journey and, and Honestly, it doesn't matter if there's a human on the other side, there's a chatbot on the other side, as long as you can be empathetic, as long as you can be polite, you can be honest and you can be direct uh, with the consumer. I don't think it matters uh, who is doing the providing the service. Got it.
Uh, so I know that you have a campaign running right now. I see the ads on OOH. So I have a question about, you know, this um, conversation about performance marketing versus using traditional for, you know, brand building. Do you feel that um, there is a large skew um, in terms of spends to achieve short-term goals over the long-term, you know, brand building awareness sort of communication? I think you have to do both. Uh, the way I look at performance marketing is like a, is like an ocean. You know, you have a lot of water in the ocean. And when you start doing performance marketing, uh, it's 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 low cost to start with because you've got lots of water in the ocean and you 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 keep on taking drawing some water from from the ocean. If you do not do something to you know bring refill the water in the ocean, if you just keep on drawing water out, after some time there'll be less water available, and therefore the the cost of getting that water will be very high. So that's the parallel between top of the funnel and bottom of the funnel. So top of the funnel builds awareness of you, about you, about your brand, about your proposition. The person may not buy it at that point in time, but he's aware, He's he knows you. And when he receives a bottom of the funnel message, he's more likely to act on it because he knew about you and trusted you as a brand. If you're only going to do bottom of the funnel messaging and people don't know you or trust you or have no awareness of you, uh, they're more, li more likely not to kind of click on you to, to go forward in the journey. And therefore, you're striking the right balance of building top of the funnel awareness and bottom of the funnel a proposition around that particular campaign is important. Therefore, get, trying the right balance is, is really, really important. And that's the way we look at doing every campaign. So what would you say your, you know, uh, traditional versus digital media mix is like, how much would you park in digital spends versus, you know, OH, TV, print, etc.? So we do about 40% uh, uh, TV and 60% is digital. Okay, got it. And, um, Another uh, thing I want to, uh, you know, come to is you've been with uh, FMCG brands for uh, almost 25 years and now with a bank. So, you know, one thing that I notice and is true is brands are built through advertising that is born out of a very authentic consumer inside. You know, the examples yeah. that you were giving me, in fact, I mean, those examples will lead to solutions in some sense, right? So can you tell us something, uh, one core consumer insight that is driving brand communication for you at Kotak right now? So I can talk about a couple of campaigns that we worked recently. So I'll talk of a gold loan campaign that we worked. And uh, so for us, gold loan uh, was a quite a small business. And we started to understand why is that the case? And uh, the 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 meta insight or the, the deeply emotional insight that, that we unearthed was the fact that uh, and, and sorry, the, the business problem was gold loan is actually a cheaper loan than many of the unsecured loans that you take. Because in the case of a gold loan, you you, you put giving the gold to the bank to keep while you take a loan, and therefore it's a secured loan to that extent versus a personal loan where you don't have anything as security, and therefore the interest rate is much higher. But we saw more people taking personal loans for their for their needs rather than in spite of having gold, but never putting up the gold as a collateral for taking a loan. And I just wondered, you know intuitively or or from a rational mind, you said, why, why would you take a more expensive loan when you can put a gold to the bank, which you're not even using. Gold is lying in your locker or gold is lying at home. You're not wearing it every day. And the bank will take care of that. And the more I probed, the more we probed consumers, we, we realized that the deep emotion inside was that giving a, giving your gold as, as a collateral almost looked like as the last, you have nothing else left. It's like your family heirloom. And in spite of the fact that you would get a cheaper loan with doing that. People would not do that because it almost signaled to the to them that they're either close to getting bankrupt or or they putting up a family heirloom uh, to to someone else. And I think that was for me the biggest unlock of the insight on gold loan. And we built a campaign around that insight, saying that look, you know, how, how do I convince consumers that taking a gold loan is a smart choice rather than a a choice of desperation? So that's how we use that insight and we converted that into this proposition. And we built a campaign around that and it did, did, did very well. So that was that was one example of an insight. The other one was uh, what we used for our active money campaign, which is, and again, the, the, the starting point was the fact that interest rates are at an all-time high. You would expect that people would not keep money in savings accounts. All of that money would be lying into fixed deposits if they would keep in the bank. Uh, but we still had like 65 lakh thousand crores of fixed deposits lying, uh, 65 lakh crores of, of, of deposits 
fixed deposits lying in or savings account lying in the industry. And I just wondered why would that be? So when you went and probed consumers to understand that behavior, what came out of the fact that you know, India has still come from a, 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 a India was an economy of scarcity. You know, people have always uh, abundance has come very recently into the country, and therefore the the thought was always the fact that if something were to happen to me or my family, I would need money, and and therefore money would get parked into a huge amount of money would get parked into into savings accounts, and then inside about fixed deposit, but that's money is fixed and I can't kind of take it. So we said, look, if we can provide you the liquidity of a fixed deposit, uh, sorry, liquidity of a savings account with the returns of a fixed deposit, would you not like that? And that is what active money is all about. And, and the entire proposition got kind of built around that. So that was last year's proposition. This year, when we want to take it forward, we said uh, we wanted to really appeal to salaried consumers. And we realized that salaried consumers have a lot of, lot of payments to make, you know, EMIs or, or payments on, on salaries to your staff and, and so on. And therefore, you do end up keeping a lot of money in the bank account for making those payments. And that what I, is what I call lazy money. So my message to the salaried consumers was that, you know, do, you know, you salary is sleeping in your account because it's not doing anything. It's just lying there. Put into active money and 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 wake it up, you know, so because it might, it'll still lie in the savings account, but it'll earn the interest of a fixed deposit. And, and, and the whole idea of liquidity versus return we applied now in the context of a salaried consumer with this insight. So that's the way we're looking at all our campaigns. We find the visceral insight which drives that proposition and build a campaign around that. Got it. And um, you have uh, a very long-standing association with Ranveer Singh. I mean, he's yes. also there in some of these ad campaigns. It's since 2018. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's six years. So can you tell me a little about, you know, how the brand has been using this association other than just the ads? We see him a lot in ads. Um, how do you make the most of a very high-profile association like this? So look, uh, the starting point was the we, we wanted to make sure that there is a strong fit between our values and Ranveer's values. You know, so a, a a bank is a bank which is there for the aspirational Indian, someone who has dreams and uh, and who has ambitions higher than their resources. And one and did a campaign on active money, and moving forward we'll do another campaign on on eight one one as we kind of go along. And and I think it's then more about what Ranveer does in his life, uh, and and how he comes across as a person. And what people love him for, and how we bring that personality into our communication, and and then it is a, yeah, you know, we 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 kind of it's a win win for both of us because we bring him a lot of awareness through the work that we do, and uh, and and that's the way we kind of use him. Uh, yeah, so we use him on all of our channels above the line, below the line. Uh, it's it's a mass media, so all all the channels which give us high reach, at low cost is where we kind of reuse him. Have you ever thought of using his voice in your, uh, you know, telephones? I mean, when you call, when someone calls the customer service line at Kotak, I mean, the way that I think some brand has used Amitabh Bachchan's voice for uh, when money is uh, deposited uh, into a, in, in one of these fintech uh, accounts. Have you ever thought of that? Uh, we haven't thought of that. That's a good idea. I have not really thought of that. So so let me okay. take that thought back and and if I do use it, I'll let you know. Good. Cool. Okay, so the festive season is coming up. Um, do you have any large campaigns planned for this? Um, is is this season one that you're banking on from a consumer sentiment point of view? Do you expect a lot of spending? Um, how are you seeing this season shaping up? So we have some campaigns uh, directed towards uh, the festive season. I'm, I'm not in a position to talk about those because they're still under wraps. Sure. But we have a strong plan to really drive spends during the festive season uh, using Kotak products. Got it. And um, I also want to talk to you a little about um, connected television. Um, we're seeing that a lot of brands are using CTV advertising I mean, through, say, uh, high impact properties like your IPL World Cup, but also, I mean, um, when there's possibly a show that's going on, um, et cetera. So have you experimented with CTV? What has your experience been like and what have you uh, learned? See, connected TV is another channel for me. And, and uh, you know, it's the same question which I kind of answer when you had television and print and outdoor and digital was coming. So people would ask me the question, oh, how are you using digital? 
I, I actually look at just as digital is another channel, connected TV is another channel. There are some consumers who are watching the choice of content on connected TV. Uh, and we want to serve advertising advertisements to them while they are in that particular channel. Given that, you know, the number of CTVs, I mean, it's about, I think, 200, 20 or 25 odd million um, CTV um, households. Given that the number is so small as compared to the number of, say, internet users or um, bro uh, television uh, households in India, do you see CTV as more of um, you will invest in it when there is a high impact property or is it something that you might invest in throughout the year? So, so most of the CTV users are more affluent consumers. Hmm. So... If I have an 811 proposition which is directed towards the core Indian consumer, I will not put it on connected TV. Yeah. If I have a more affluent proposition and the consumer who's on CTV is a more affluent consumer, I will serve that consumer with that advertisement for that particular proposition. So again, as I said that, it is not about it, it, uh, whether we are at 20 or at 100. It's yeah. about do we have a good understanding of who's that customer and what is the right messaging to give to that customer on that particular channel. So connected TV is growing very fast. I think it's more affluent consumers at this stage, but we have to we have to start small, but, but as that segment grows, uh, we will we will keep on. Uh, so we are at connect, on connected TV and we are serve, using it depending on the type of consumer whom we want to serve right now. Got it. Um, and I think with that, you have answered uh, all the questions I had in mind for you, uh, Rohit. And uh, thank you so much for your time today, being so generous uh, with it. Thank you so much, Sushmita, for having me over. Wonderful chatting with you. And uh, all the best uh, for completing 25 years at AFEX.